I'm kind of obsessed with this man. I'm disturbed. I've read dark romances that I felt less sinister than this book. And like, I don't condone violence, but maybe sometimes we can have it as a sexy little treat. I knew I was in danger. Hi everyone, I'm Kat. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm starting this video in a very random spot. I'm starting this video where I just ended my last video. I didn't really feel like getting ready today. So we're just, we're just casual. And I'm very excited to read some new release romances with you. This is going to be one of those videos where I don't have a very set TBR. I think I have like five or six things that I really wanna to get to that I'm really excited about. And as the week goes on, we're just gonna see what I'm able to read. I mentioned, I think in my TBR video that I'm like entering my reading era. I don't know what happened. Something about the tortured poets department did something to me. I don't, I can't explain it. I don't even like most of the album. I'm not really a Taylor Swift fan. I, why am I getting into this? <laughs> Let's just get into it. I was a fan of her when her original album came out, I think up until Red. And I actually went to a concert of hers. I think it was on the Red tour. And one of my friend's moms knew someone who worked at the stadium and they got us like box seat tickets, which is so crazy to think about. Like, can you even imagine what that would cost nowadays? <laughs> but that was like the last thing I ever listened to from her. I never really liked any of her music past then. I think my music taste really changed past that. And now I mostly just listen to like punk alternative, like screamo stuff, like A Day to Remember, Our Last Night. So she's just not really my taste. I actually have several Taylor Swift covers on my playlist from like screamo metal bands. So I've always thought she was a good songwriter. It was just her music style was never really my taste, but I like covers of her songs that are more in my style. But I decided to give the Tortured Poets Department a try. And I was like up at midnight listening to this. I just happened to be up. So I decided to listen to it. And I got a notification that I was like in the first 5% of people that listened to the album, which is really funny considering I'm not a fan. But I like some of the songs on the album, three to be specific, uh, So Long London, Who's Afraid of Little Old Me, and The Smallest Man Who Ever Lived. And I can't explain why, but I feel like suddenly I really want to read a ton again. And it just correlated directly with that album release. <laughs> I don't know. Tangent aside, here are some of the books I'm thinking about reading this week. I'm just going to read as much as I can, get to as many as I can. And I think I'm going to start with, where is it? Here We Go Again by Alison Cochran. Okay, I just finished the first chapter and something that needs to end soon because in 10 pages, it's already making me cringe and annoying me. Um, we're reading from Logan. I think we read, yeah, the next chapter is from Rosemary's perspective. We're reading from Logan's perspective and already, I think four times, she uses like a celebrity's name as a curse almost. Like she says, Kristen fucking Stort in the name of Shay Mitchell's hair and Ruby fucking Rose, she had. That needs to stop. One, I just hate pop culture references. I can take a couple, but like four in 10 pages. And two, it's just like feels weird and cringy. Like no one actually talks like that. It hasn't stopped. And I actually have so many bad things to say about both of the books that I'm reading right now. I I don't know what to talk about and what not to talk about because I really don't want this update to be like 30 minutes. The celebrity names as curses has continued on and continued on so much I've actually started keeping track of it. And I think I'm at 14, about 150 pages through. And I know I've actually missed some because I've been listening to the audiobook a bit while I've been driving. So I haven't noted those down. So Logan and Rosemary met in middle school, were friends throughout middle school into high school. Something happened that broke their friendship apart. They haven't spoken in years, but now they're both like 30-ish, I think. And they've both returned to their hometown and they're working as teachers at the same school that they went to high school at. And they both share a mentor from high school, Joe, who was their teacher in high school. He's now like in his 60s and he just got a terminal cancer diagnosis. And he really doesn't want to die just like 
in a hospital room. So he asks both Rosemary and Logan, even though they now kind of hate each other and avoid each other at all costs, to drive him across the country to a cabin in Maine where he just wants to live out his last days. They are in either Washington or Oregon. I know they're in the PNW. So even though they both really don't want to do this because they really don't want to spend time together, they agree to because they just love and respect Joe so much and they want to be able to like fulfill his dying wish. So most of this is like a road trip book, which is fun, but I hate, like at different points I've hated all of these characters. Logan is the worst. I have consistently hated her throughout the book. She is the one who keeps doing the celebrity name thing. And she's also just an asshole and like, characters within the book have said she's an asshole and that she like doesn't care about anyone's feelings and she has kind of agreed to this and I think that's going to be part of her journey like we find out why she acts this way something in her past I'm assuming like you know she wants to keep people at a distance something like that and already she's said like I don't want to act like this any anymore so it's going to be her journey but it's going to be a hard redemption she also just like has the humor and the demeanor of like a 13 year old boy. I'm parked downtown right now, so sorry if there's like really loud annoying noises. But like one example, they go to see the Grand Canyon and this is Logan's reaction. The Grand Canyon is cool shit. It's dope as fuck. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just like can't imagine a 30 year old woman reacting like that. It just gives me 13 year old boy vibes. Rosemary is probably the character I like the most, I guess, but she also has been really fucking annoying me at different points. In my head, I'm picturing her as like a blonde Vivian Kensington from Legally Blonde, just the way that they describe her dressing. And she's just described as being like very buttoned up, very serious, hyper organized. She's the one who has organized this whole trip, like down to when they're going to take bathroom breaks. And part of the reason why I am liking her is because she reminds me of me is that weird to say that i like her because she seems like me but i'm just like able to relate to her in that way in the way that she really wants everything to be very organized and a very set schedule and she gets anxiety if that schedule is changed for any reason and like me hello she also has adhd which i'm connecting to and i'm also feeling sympathetic towards her because both logan and joe just like don't give a fuck about this and are consistently changing the plans and like throwing her off course and don't seem to care at all that this is making her feel really anxious and uncomfortable. Like at one point Logan takes a turn driving and Rosemary falls asleep in the van and when she wakes up she finds out that they're in Arizona. So like they were going from the PNW to Maine and she finds out that they're in Arizona and Joe convinced Logan to go off course because he wanted to see the Grand Canyon. And uh, like, Joe is already making these people do a huge favor for him, like drive him across country. He's very sick, he's in a wheelchair, he has a service dog with him. Like it's not an easy trip. And they're also like driving to him to his death essentially. It's a, a big thing to ask of two people. And then, he's like making it worse for one of them by making them go 500 or so miles off course and adding like so much time onto their route. I, I don't know, it's really annoying me. I'm getting hot as fuck sitting in the car. It's like 85 degrees out today. So that's all I'll talk about for right now. I'll update you on my other book, maybe when I get home later. I'm downtown because I'm going to the indie bookstore. It was Independent Bookstore Day a couple days ago and Chelsea G. Summers, who wrote one of my favorite books, A Certain Hunger, um, came out with like a, an exclusive, I think it's a novella that were only being sold in indie bookstores. So I ordered it online and I'm coming to pick it up and I'm very excited to read it. Friends are getting married, they're all settling down. So I lay here, watch the ceiling fan growing around. I got my book, which I'm happy I got and I'm seeing this as more of a supporting an author I really like and supporting my local bookstore. $15 feels like a little bit much for this. It's like 60 pages and the font is actually huge. So in a more typical book font, it'll probably be more like 40 pages maybe. It feels like a little much. The cover is gorgeous and it matches the vibe of A Certain Hunger. So I'm happy to own it. 
Now let's talk more shit. So it was probably a mistake as someone who really has a hard time with enemies to lovers to read two enemies to lovers romances at the same time, but that's what happened. I started Hate Mail by Donna Marchetti. I'm on page 80, so I'm not too far in. We're reading from Naomi and Luca, who when they were in middle school, their schools were doing like a pen pal program. Luca's in California, Naomi's in Oklahoma. So they started writing to each other. Naomi first wrote him like a just super normal letter as like a fifth grader, like, hi, I like the ocean. Like, what's your favorite color? And Luca just wrote back something really, really mean because he thought the whole thing was stupid. And he just didn't want his pen pal to respond, but he didn't want to get in trouble for for being the one to stop. But Naomi wasn't put off enough by the mean things he was writing. So she continued to write him back, but just also wrote really mean things. So they wrote to each other like throughout middle school, throughout high school, just mean letters back and forth. And now they're adults. I don't remember if it said how old they were, but Naomi is working as a weather person and she gets a letter, like an anonymous letter at the news station, I guess. And it's just like, I hope you die basically but and it's not signed or anything but she knows who it's from and they actually haven't written letters back and forth to each other in like two years and i think the last letter luca wrote was telling her that he was getting married and naomi tried to write him a couple times after that but her letters were always returned as undeliverable and he also didn't include a return address on this last letter that he sent so she wants to write back to him but she doesn't know how so she's telling her friend at work about this whole situation and like this whole long story of how this relationship started and her friend Anne is like we need to track him down so you know 80 pages in they're on a plane to California <laughs> showing up at his old address from fifth grade and like talking to his neighbors and she's she's trying to find Luca I really love when books include like letters and emails and text messages I just think it adds something else fun to read so I was really excited about this but as soon as we started getting some of the letters I, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in danger. They are really mean. They're not just like, you stink. They are cutthroat insults. And I'll, I'll read you an excerpt of one that I highlighted that I was just like, and at first I was like, okay, these people are in fifth grade. Like I can kind of let it go. I can kind of get past it. I can see how a like 10 or 11 year old thinks it's kind of funny to just be really mean back and forth to each other. I think it's stupid as a 27 year old woman, but I can get past it. But you know, this goes into high school and they just like are continuously meaner and meaner. I won't read you this whole letter because it's kind of long, but this is from Luca to Naomi. I hope that at some point in your life, there will be someone you love and respect more than anyone else. I hope that you think you can count on this person to always be there and you can tell them anything. And then I hope that one day he decides to leave. They won't look you in the eye. They won't tell you they love you and they won't even say goodbye. They probably never even really loved you and they're fine with not saying goodbye because it was all an act. You have plenty of good memories, but they just shit all over them. You can't even remember the good times anymore. You're such a shitty person that you don't deserve a real goodbye. And it just goes like on and on. And we get some insight to this because in Luca's perspective, we know that his dad essentially just did this to him. Like his parents end up getting a divorce and this is how he feels after finding out his father is leaving. When his father tells them, tells him they're getting a divorce, he's like, yeah, I'm gonna move and I'm probably never gonna come back here, which is very strange. But Naomi does not have this context. Like they don't really tell each other anything about their lives. They really just send insults back and forth. So like, can you imagine receiving that letter from somebody? And there are some things that Luca says that are so off-putting and concerning to me. The thing about Naomi was that no matter how mean I was, she always wrote back and I was really, really mean. After my dad left, I used her as a virtual punching bag. And then after this, he looks her up on Facebook for the first time. This was like when Facebook was first invented. So this is the first time he's actually seeing what she looks like. And he's like, oh my God, she's really hot. Like she's hotter. And this is when they're in the high school. She's hotter than any girl at my school. She's hotter than any girl I've seen in real life. And after realizing how hot she is, he's like, I wish that I could take back all of the mean things I had ever written to her. So it's like, he regrets being mean 
because she's not ugly. I don't know, I'm just having a really hard time seeing why I'm supposed to be rooting for this relationship. And I glanced at some reviews and I see a lot of the same language being used. Like, this is so fun. Their letters back and forth are so hilarious. And I'm like, I'm not... I'm not giggling. I'm not even cracking a smile. And before Naomi really starts searching for Luca, she ends up meeting this guy in her building and he asks her out. And now when she's in San Diego, her and this guy, Jake, are like texting back and forth and flirting and you know. And I, I don't know if I should talk about this or not because I don't want to spoil it. I'm like 99% sure this is the case. I don't know. Do you guys care about spoilers in romance? I really don't because I just feel like all romance is pretty obvious and it's more about like the things that the book makes you feel rather than the actual plot. Skip ahead, I'll put a time up here if you want to skip ahead to not hear this, but I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that Jake is Luca. I just, I feel it deep in my bones because at first I was like, okay, maybe this is going to be a little love triangle thing, but because it doesn't say anything about it being a love triangle in the synopsis, I just feel like Jake is Luca. And maybe I shouldn't talk more about how my feelings are towards this because I don't know if that's actually going to happen. But if it is the case, I'm disturbed because he's purposefully lying to her about who he is. She never, well, she tried to look him up, but his profile was like really locked down and all she could see was his profile picture. And it was like a group of 10 guys. So she never knew who he was. And that was back in high school. So only he knows what she looks like. So he knows that Naomi is Naomi. Ugh, I just feel like there's gonna be some deception and lying and weird things happening that I'm not gonna enjoy. The lyric, you deserve prison but you won't get time, has never felt more apt until this moment, both for the male main character in this book and for the author for creating him. I've read dark romances that I felt less sinister than this book. What is going on? I can't remember a time I have felt such a negative reaction towards a book. I was genuinely upset by this. I will give another time to skip to because I'm going to get into full spoilers because truly this is not a book I would recommend to anyone. But if you have it on your TBR and you're like very excited by it still, you can skip to this time. I gave it a one star and would not recommend. Why would you make your love interest write horrible mean things? There's never any break from that they truly never build any other sort of relationship like they never talk about what's going on in their lives things they like things they're doing they never have a real conversation it's all just insults you also have this man say sexist and misogynistic things throughout the book he's dating another woman at some point and like everything he says about her it's just like boomer I hate my wife comedy and then have him coincidentally run into his pen pal in real life but don't have him tell the pen pal he knows who she is have him form a relationship with her when she still doesn't know who he is have him have sex with her when she still doesn't know who he is I just genuinely don't know what part of this romance I was supposed to like or enjoy and there are way too many good reviews for this what about this are people liking? Why would you like a man like this? So I'll be honest, that turned into a bit of a hate read, which can be fun every so often. Sometimes I just want to read a book that makes me mad and I want to rant about it. it feels good every so often. What What isn't a fun hate read is here we go again. I am just past the 50% mark and I'm gonna DNF this. I just don't like any of these characters. They're all annoying me. They're all making me mad. And it's really hard to care about a romance when you don't even care about the people involved in the romance and like hate mail like i said was at least fun to like bitch about this, i'm not having fun bitching about this i can't believe this was written by the same person who wrote the charm offensive which i liked didn't love and kiss her once for me which i did really love it feels so different like i just i i can't believe she created these characters and again like i said about the last book we were supposed to like them. I kind of wanted to keep going just because I do feel like this could make me cry and I do love to cry while reading um, when we get towards the end and we get towards the end of Joe's life. But like, it seems silly to finish a book I'm really not liking just so I can shed a little tear because I need to start just for the summer next. And yes, not just want to, need to. I need good writing. I need good humor. I need good banter. I need good 
likable characters and I also think this will make me cry so like forget the other book that I'm not liking and let's just start this instead I'm so excited Finally, some good fucking food. I'm about 150 pages into just for the summer and I'm really loving it. I'm kind of obsessed with this man. I feel like the birds chirping are annoying. So Justin and Emma both have this curse where it seems like every time they date someone and then they break up, their ex then goes on to meet their soulmate. They end up getting married and Justin and Emma are just kind of like forever single. Justin makes a Reddit post where he mentions this. It's not even like the sole focus of the post, but it ends up going viral and Emma sees it and messages him being like, hey, I have the same problem. So they decide to try dating each other and then breaking up after a certain amount of time so they can both go on to meet their soulmate. Emma is a travel nurse. I think it's like every six weeks her assignment changes and she can choose where she wants to go. So she decides to go to Minnesota where Justin is so they can enact this plan. And she's with her best friend and foster sister, Maddie, who is also a travel nurse and they always live together. And I'm pretty sure this is a mention in the synopsis. Yeah, so it's not a spoiler. Um, but Emma is dealing with her toxic mother who was very neglectful her whole life and has always been kind of in and out of her life. And Justin's mother is actually going to prison for something. So he, in a couple of weeks, is going to be taking custody of his three younger siblings. I mentioned I was excited for this because I just love a gimmick in a romance book. I think it makes it so much more fun than just like two people meeting and falling in love. Like I like having something going on and they definitely lean into it. And they're very like rigid in their plans for this breaking of the curse and they like plan out how long they're going to date for, how many dates they're going to go on, if kissing is allowed, like certain things they need to do that they've done in other relationships that they think will make the curse happen, which means they can then break the curse. And why I love Justin is because he's just so cute and thoughtful. Before they go on their first date, he sends her a survey, your date with Justin. And it's like, different multiple choice questions. Preferred time of day, what activities interest you, fanciness level, preferred greeting, preferred mode of transportation. And then after she like fills it out and sends it back to him, he sends her an evite with like the date and everything written all out. Please join Justin at the address you provided at 11 a.m. sharp for a surprise activity, lunch, and conversation. Please wear long pants. And then after they go on their date, he sends her like an exit interview with like questions about how he acted, how she liked the food, how she liked the conversation. And I just love it. We do get to read from both of their perspectives and just like from the moment Justin sees Emma, you can tell he's obsessed with her. So this definitely has a he falls first five, even though she is really liking him as well, like more than she expected to, because both of them just kind of went into this thinking it was just going to be fun, quick, you know, like six weeks hanging out with someone to then go on to find my soulmate. But he's like obsessed with her and he's just really sweet and I'm really liking it. I also started an audiobook, which I'm not far enough into to give you any thoughts so far. Um, I started happily, is it never or ever? I don't know. Happily Never or Ever After by Lynn Painter. I'm actually going to be going on a trip this weekend, so I wanted an audiobook to listen to. And this starts off with Sophie at her wedding, walking down the aisle, about to get married to Stuart. And as they're doing like the vows and everything, when they ask if anyone objects, a guy stands up and says that Stuart and Sophie can't get married because Stuart has been cheating on Sophie, which like shock and awe, but Sophie actually knew. She found out before the wedding that Stuart was cheating on her but she didn't want to call off the wedding because her father works for Stort's father. And she thought if she called off the wedding and all of the money that Stort's family spent was wasted, um, his father would fire her father, which she didn't want to happen. So her and her friend actually hired this guy who works as a professional objector to come and end the wedding. And then afterwards, her and her friend just end up getting drunk and the objector Max shows up to get paid, but then ends up hanging out with them and like drinking with them. And they have a fun little night, nothing 
nothing too fun. But Sophie is really interested in his job as an objector. It's not really his job. It's like a little side thing he does. Um, so a little while later, he ends up asking Sophie to go to a wedding with him and be the objector. And from the synopsis, I think they like start doing this regularly. Again, not too far into it, but it's fun so far. And like I said, I like a nice little gimmick. I'm not sure how many updates I'm going to be able to give you for either of these books because like I said I'm going on a trip tomorrow I'm going to Asheville with my sister which I'm very excited about I'll put some pictures of our Airbnb up because it looks very cute it's like in the mountains with a hot tub and we're just planning to have a very chill fun weekend but I like never film when I'm doing things or with other people because I just don't like it so I don't know how great my updates are going to be the next time I see you like I may be done these two books but we'll see okay I just got to our cabin and it is so much more beautiful than I even looked in the pictures. It's so cute. We're like on top of a Vulcan Mountain. Driving here was a little bit scary, but I'll show you a quick clip because honestly, I said I was going to put in pictures earlier. The pictures don't even do it justice. But I just wanted to give you a quick update because I listened to more of Happily Never After on my drive up here and I was genuinely tweaking in the fucking car. I don't know what happened. In the beginning, I was feeling like kind of lukewarm about it. It wasn't bad, but I wasn't obsessed or like overly moved by anything that was happening but I think around the 10-15% mark it just got so good like once they go to their first wedding together it, it's just been incredible ever since. The chemistry between these two is so palpable and they just have really nice like quick smart witty banter with each other and I don't know if it's just because this is really focused around weddings, but I'm picturing them as Katherine Heigl and James Marsden in 27 Dresses specifically. And with th those images in mind, with those people in mind, it's just been really working for me. I love Sophie. She's so straightforward. Like both of them are thinking like, wow, we have a lot of chemistry together. And then right after that, Sophie's like, so we have a lot of chemistry. And then they actually end up kissing. And both of them are thinking like, this was an incredible kiss. This was the best kiss I've ever had. And Sophie's just like, this was an incredible kiss. This was the best kiss I've ever had. Like, what was up with that? She just says exactly what she's feeling, and I love it. We've also devolved into some fake dating, which I didn't know we were going to get. But both of them, for different reasons, like, want to show people in their lives that they have moved on, that they're dating someone, that they're kind of getting ready to settle down. So they agree to fake date each other. And it's just so fucking funny. I've mentioned before, like, I very rarely laugh when I'm reading. And especially when I'm listening to an audiobook, I don't know, it just doesn't, like, books very rarely pull a laugh out of me. I was cracking up at this. And there were two moments in particular that had me tweaking in the car. Like, I was genuinely gripping the wheel, screaming. I don't know why a lot of times in books, these, like, overly macho, jealous, overly protective moments really don't work for me. And I actually end up really not liking them. But in here... It just did something to me. Okay, what can I say? Um, at one point, they're at a wedding and they object to it. And the groom is the one who gets out and is like being a bad person. And he's screaming at Sophie and like calling her a stupid bitch, getting up in her face. And Max is like, don't you fucking talk to her like that? And then he punches him. And like, I don't condone violence, but maybe sometimes we can have it as a sexy little treat. And at another point, they're out and they run into Sophie's ex-fiance, Stort. And Max just like mentions like, I look down at Stort. And they talk about how Stort was always really uh, insecure about his height and Max is like a sexy 6'2". I don't know. It also did something for me. What can I say? Sue me. Anyway, those are the updates for now. I'm really, really loving this book and I'm really excited for our night. I'm about to start dinner. I'm going to make a sourdough cast iron pizza. My sister should be here soon. And I think we're just going to like hang out in the hot tub and read and enjoy the vibes. And I'm excited. I'm going to let you know for the next two months, you're going to see me in kind of weird, unrecognizable places because I am fully booked for the next two months for house sitting. I think I'm going to be spending two nights at home over the next two months and like not consecutively. So you're going to see me in places you don't recognize, but whatever. I am here to give you my final wrap up. Just for the summer, I'm going to give four and a half stars. I really, really loved this. I am just 
down bad for Justin. He is the sweetest and most thoughtful man. I love him. I unfortunately didn't end up crying while reading this. While I can fully acknowledge what Emma is going through and dealing with is so, so difficult, I can't like personally relate to it. So I feel like it didn't impact me in that way. And while there have definitely been situations that I haven't been personally affected by that I have cried over and felt very emotionally impacted by, this one just didn't do it for me for whatever reason. I got pretty annoyed with the way Emma's friend and Justin a little bit, but mostly Emma's friend criticized her for the reason she gave for not wanting to be with Justin or not being willing to fully try things out with Justin. And that's because of the kids, his siblings that he is now the guardian of. I've been going back and forth because like, I realized this excuse was kind of something she was hiding behind and she just really needed to work on things with herself and with her mother to be able to move past this. And like, I guess deep down she did want this, but I don't know, it just annoyed me because like she would say like, oh, I'm not ready to take on these three kids in this tumultuous kind of situation. And her friend would be like, you're just being scared. I'm like, it is completely valid to be hesitant to taking on two teenagers and a toddler. But I don't know, like I said, I've been going back and forth. I do think part of your world is still my favorite out of this series world, but I do think this is a close second. I thought it was really fun and funny and I really loved the male main character. And when we're talking about that, can I just say, I really loved the vaguely magical element that was in part of your world. And I'm really sad Abby Menes didn't continue that throughout the series. I don't know why she did that. And the last book I'm gonna update you on, you may have seen me starting another book that I haven't mentioned yet in some B-roll maybe, but that book is just like a three star nothing book. I don't even feel like talking about it, but Happily Never After, I also really, really loved. I'm gonna give this four and a half stars as well. I saw a negative review that was complaining about how unrealistic this is, which like, yes, but also who cares? It is absolutely unbelievable that there are so many people in their circle as well. Like they don't do outside advertising. This is all like word of mouth that so many people want to get out of a wedding and a marriage but can't for whatever reason so they need to hire an objector it's very un unbelievable that that is so common and so needed that an entire business is born out of it but i also feel like there are so many classic rom-coms like movies that are also really unbelievable like 27 dresses i talked about earlier uh how to lose a guy in 10 days the proposal, like, could you see any of those situations happening in real life? I digress. I thought this was really fun and I thought Max and Sophie had such good chemistry and such good banter. This was actually funny. This made me laugh so much, which is really rare for books in general, but specifically audiobooks. Sophie also has a really fun, silly dynamic with her roommates who are two elderly people. It kind of reminded me of the living situation in Bridesmaids, uh, but not as, weird and off-putting and more wholesome and sweet. Is it the greatest romance I've ever read? And did it even come close to the emotional depth that was in like something like this? No, but I just had such a good time reading it. We started this vlog off on kind of a rocky note, but I think we ended in a very good place, which I'm happy about. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next one. Bye. <laughs>